This is episode 51 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 51 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today I have Mark Loeffler on the show and Mark is the author of one of the first real estate books I ever read, a book about rent to own in Canada. I found him very interesting at the time and now about nine years later, I had the opportunity to sit down with him face to face, ask him all the questions I have about what he does. Mark is a very successful multifamily residential investor, primarily invested in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, with over 170 doors at the moment. His story is absolutely fantastic. His determination and his willingness to take action is admirable, and it is something that I think we can all take something from. This is one of my favorite interviews to date because I'm very interested in multifamily investing, and Mark is right in the thick of it. He is filled with wisdom and you're absolutely going to love this. Just a quick reminder, if you are new to this podcast, don't be afraid to go all the way back to episode one and start at the beginning. There is a chronology to this podcast and every episode builds a little bit on what we've done before. So the questions I ask change over time. If you go back to those first ones, we're heavy into the numbers about burying properties and how to create instant equity in properties so that you can refinance them, pull your money back out and have a cash flowing asset that you're in with either no or very little money. Real estate investing is a journey and it takes time to learn all these things. It's absolutely best if you can go back to the beginning and make sure that you take it all in. But without further ado, please do enjoy today's episode number 51 with Mark Loeffler. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today I have Mark Loeffler on the show and Mark didn't know it, but he was actually one of the first books I ever read on real estate investing, one of his books. So Awesome. Which one did you read? I read the Rent to Own one Rent to own, yeah. back in like 2011 and I'm like, wow, this is genius. And I started posting Kijiji ads right after I, uh, I saw your, uh, nice. read your book. Uh, but uh, first off, thank you very much for coming in. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, like you were a guy that I looked up to from way back when and finally have the chance to uh, interview you here in person. So I appreciate that. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, Mark, if you don't mind, I'm sure there's plenty of our listeners and viewers who haven't actually heard of you. Um, I know you have two books, right? Two books. Yeah. Uh, do you want to just start with which books you've written and then talk about yourself as a real estate investor and where you started? Sure. Uh, so for two books, obviously, I read um, my first book is Investing in Rent to Own Properties, A Complete Canadian Guide. Uh, and then I wrote uh, Fix and Flip for Canadian Real Estate Investors with Ian Zabel. And yeah, uh, real estate investor, I started investing in duplexes uh, and bungalows, putting extra s- secondary suites into them in New Market. I uh, did a bunch of investing in Toronto and Cornwall. And then I found my love, which is Hamilton. Cornwall? I did a lot in Cornwall. It was just cash flow. Wow. Yeah, that's a long ways out, though. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, for yeah. good cash flow you go places right so you go places for cash flow uh so now i'm i'm mainly like 98 percent of my stuff is in uh, hamilton okay tell me a little bit about your portfolio where it you know where it started what's the number now so i started doing duplexes and then got into threes and four units slowly graduated into some smaller multis and then i bought an 18 unit vacant property that, and that was in hamilton that was in hamilton um and then from there I, I continued doing some smaller stuff and then it's like well you know it's, it's just easier to do bigger buildings for me it's just from a capital standpoint if you have enough capital then it's you know it's hard to deploy a lot of capital on smaller projects yeah i, I think like you hear a lot of people say you know it's just as much work to do a small deal as it is to do a big deal and i think a lot of people hear it and they're like yeah right and i don't really believe that well, I mean, it depends on your systems and your models, right? Like the systems and models I have in place, I bought an apartment building in, uh, in July, 51 units. And I think I've maybe spent three hours on the whole, the, the, the project since then. So what type of systems allow you to have a 50 plus unit building only consume three hours of your time? So, I mean, I have a property manager. I have a basically a co- general contractor that works for me full time. Um, and a lot of those three hours is either talking to the property manager or talking to him. Okay. Um, and then, you know, obviously my financing person knows like once you get into commercial, it's not about you, it's about your portfolio. They know my portfolio, they have all my information. So it's just simple to go ahead and 
and, and to put one more deal together, right? Yeah, because they're doing their annual review anyway. So they already have all your stuff and you're just adding one more in. Okay, well, just let's do one more. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what I'm doing personally. I could have zero income personally and they're still going to finance me, right? So, and that's another reason why I made the switch from residential to commercial is it's just, it's now easier for me to get financing. Yeah, I, I sort of joke that that's taking off the training wheels. You doing doing things on the residential side are sort of like training wheels. I'm still there at the moment, yeah. but uh, but the next mo- you know the next uh, thing to do is commercial. Well, I mean that's funny though. I tell everyone that you you make a higher percentage return in, in the residential side because you can do it quicker. Yeah, and you know you can have it like you can have a um, duplex conversion converted in six months. You can have it fully funded and and you're out in eight months. Absolutely. Right. So you can have no money in a deal in eight months and have a cash flowing property. I've had a property done, renovated and refinanced inside of like three months. Inside. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it's, hard to do, though. It's hard to do. So I say eight months because it's, you know, it's a little bit more relaxed time frame and you don't have to kill yourself. Right. And Absolutely. yeah, it's still like, like six, three months, six months, eight months. You get all your money back within a year. Mm-hmm. I mean, you kind of have to be stupid not to. Right. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic model. I guess where most investors are are is they're they're utilizing that residential model as long as they get a yes, and then eventually they start getting well. We're not really sure, but maybe a, as an exception, yeah. which is sort of where I'm at right now, um, because you get more and they just don't want to do it. Well, that's right. And well, it, it's funny on the residential side for financing, they look at it and say, well, the bigger your portfolio, the riskier you are. Yeah. Where on the commercial side, they say, oh, the bigger your portfolio, the less risk you are. Isn't that hilarious? I. What, what a dichotomy. Like, it just it, makes no sense. It doesn't. But yet on the residential side, they're looking at, at it based on your income. Right. Right. As the commercial side, they're looking at, at it based on the assets income. Yeah. Can you just clarify? Because I talk about this a fair bit, but I know there's listeners that haven't wrapped their head around this, how the two are different. So commercial lending, you're not talking commercial retail stores. You're still talking residential units. Yes. But they're treating it with commercial lending. Can you just explain for our listeners how that's different? So again, on the residential side, it's based on your income. So if you make half a million dollars a year, you're going to get financed a heck of a lot, right? Because the way they do their their loan provisions and their loss provisions and uh, how they take your rent into account and all that type of thing. Yet on the commercial side, it's all about the asset. Uh, I mean, my net worth does come into play. Yet, you know, once they know you, like you, trust you, then they waive your fees. They do a whole bunch of different things, which it does cost more to get a commercial mortgage. Yeah. Right? So I think that scares some people because I get people jumping from residential to commercial. And I'm like, yeah, you should set aside about $10,000 that you don't mind losing whether you buy a property or not. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I go, well, you know, your commercial inspection is going to cost you anywhere from 1500 to 2500 depending on the financing you're getting. Your appraisal is going to be 1500 to 2500 And you got a lending fee. You got to pay a fee as you put in the application. Yeah, the, usually to, when they give you a discussion paper, you have to give them about a half a percent, sometimes a quarter percent. Yep, and then there's their fee on closing, plus you're paying for their lawyer. Yeah. That's the real kicker. The extra lawyer. I, I noticed that, you know, coming from the mortgage business, I saw this and I'm like, holy crap, like these people are paying like $10,000 just to close a deal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. If not more, Could be right? more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like our our last like 51 units. I mean, we were on both lawyers on each side. I think we were $7,500 in legal fees. So just the legal fees and then you had everything else on top of that. Now, your book was Fix and Flip. Yes. Is still, I, I got to read that one still, but uh Can you tell me a little bit about what inspired that? Like, are you applying a fix and flip model to your multi multi multi-residential properties or was that in the past for you? So, I mean, I think anybody who's doing buy, rent or refinance, the Burr, which is actually what I wanted to call the book, but Wiley didn't like the title back then. And who knew that that was going to be the big buzzword now, right? Burr is whatever everybody's talking about. Well, they're they're crediting it to Brandon Turner, right? They're saying that he came up with it. I know Brandon too. Like Brandon and I were in a networking group together and and it's fine i don't really care i mean i i, I never knew burr like yeah. I, I never called it that but I, that's what i wanted to it, yeah that, that's what my book is basically talks about too and i always tell people never sell yeah like it, it, there's no point in ever selling the only reason i sold my small stuff when i got into the larger stuff is because i wanted to free up my personal finances so they weren't ever involved in anything 
Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that as an option now because all the stuff I own personally is going to affect me from buying homes, you know, for myself in the future. So I'm looking at the option and, you know, loosely talking about it with a banker about finding a way to move that all over to a corp into a commercial loan uh, so that I'm basically resetting the clock on myself. Well, yeah. And then the other thing is, is why well, I sold the smaller stuff is because at some point it just get it gets more annoying after you own, you know, a couple 20 unit buildings and you're the majority of the time I was putting in was going to the smaller buildings, right? Because there's, there's more turnover in those, there's more, more maintenance in those because they're not built to be at like, and I, right now I only buy, um, concrete construction buildings, only concrete, only concrete. Cause it, there's less maintenance. It's easier to work on stuff. It's easier to do things. Right. And it's, it's, it's just ease. It's just for ease of, of use, ease of mark. And I'm willing to pay a little bit more to have that yeah. more enjoyable ownership experience. Yeah. And I think there's a maturity that as a real estate investor that you reach that eventually the cash flow you're getting from your portfolio is enough. So now you can be smarter about your acquisitions. You're not just trying to push that number and take whatever you can get to get there. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll take a more moderate cash flow knowing that it's going to, it's going to build sanity. Well, that's it. Yeah. And in the renovation business, that's like the equivalent to me not taking the lowest bidder. I don't, I don't take the cheapest contractor. I, I take the guy that I know I can build a relationship with yeah. and who's going to get the job done. Who's going to show up. Who's going to yeah. you know, do quality work too. Right. Yeah, there's so many variables, but I feel like when people get started, their mindset is, you know, in renovations and in, in buying, you know, max my cash flow. Even if I have to take a bad asset with wonky floors up and down, my first property, wonky floors up and down, I won't own something like that anymore. Well, I used to buy the worst, <laughs> yeah. like the worst, the worst, like, cause I'm a real, I was, I'm a real estate agent and I used to work for investors a lot. So I would buy whatever they didn't want. Okay. So I ended up with some of the worst stuff in Hamilton. And then it just became like, hey, listen, you got drug infested, um, hoarder houses, fire damaged, crackheads, whatever. You tell me, I'll buy it. Seriously. So as long as the price was right, you were, you were into well, it? Well, I was getting it super cheap because nobody else wanted it, right? So if my investors didn't want it, who else is going to buy it, right? So and, and you're probably talking about a time where Hamilton, which is like in the Golden Horseshoe, lenders didn't want to lend in certain areas of, of Hamilton. Yeah, I wasn't buying so much in those areas, but lenders, like the banks wouldn't finance my properties when I bought. Like I remember having a Scotia Bank appraiser come out and he basically looked at the property and it was leaning a little bit. And I was like, listen, it's been there a hundred years. Like who cares if it's leaning a bit, right? Yeah. And he's like, nope, no financing. And then I went, I had bought a hoarder house and he's like, I'm not going inside there. There's no way you're getting appraised. <laughs> and same thing on the fire damage. They're like, we can't give you a value. And I'm like, I'm like, so I phoned up my private guy who I'd done a bunch of stuff with. And I'm like, I don't care he's, if he's not giving me a value. I know what the end value is. Yeah. Like, you know, I know what I'm doing. He's like, yeah, no problem. I'll talk to the investor. And it was fine. Right. Yeah. But it's like. You can, you can even, yeah, just going on land value and then end value. Like they could probably put something together. Yeah. And land value, end value. And then what's the cost to renovate? Here's my, here, here's my contractor's construction cost. Yeah. Like. So there, you're speaking to the value of private financing right there. Oh, private, like a, a lot of people say, I don't want to do it because the interest rate's too high. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'd rather do it and, and be, be more flexible, right? Like, okay, so I'm tied in for six months and then I can, I can get exit at any time I want. My goal is always to exit to go to a bank. I don't want to hold it long term, but you know, it, it does have its place, right? Like, I mean, whether it's six months or a year, ties you over till you can get that bank financing. Okay. How long is your time horizon on, and I guess there's probably no standard because every building's so different. Give me a range, like what, what your, you know, a 20 plex might take to turn around if you buy it with private financing. So we don't do that on those ones. You try not to? No. Um, I mean, I wouldn't unless it was vacant. And then to be honest with you, I'd probably just buy cash rather than finance just because of my partners. Okay, so you'll work with some partners that'll help you get some cash in there. Yeah, I, and I might do for rentals, and I've done it in the past. Like when I bought the 18 unit, we worked with a credit union. Okay. They did a purchase plus finance or purchase plus uh, construction for us. Okay. Um, same thing, we bought a um, uh, 19 unit at uh, Hamilton in, uh, sorry, Ottawa on Main Street. Okay. Um, and we, but we did that through the credit union too. Um, I mean, it's more expensive, yet it's not private financing money, right? 
Yeah, what would you be in, like six or seven percent to do that purchase plus construction? No, they were uh, whatever the the bank Bank of Canada rate plus four or something. Oh, okay, so closer to like nine. And we're very no, it was uh, one point seven five plus four, so we were like five point seven five. Something oh, like the overnight rate. Overnight rate. Oh, okay, yeah, the yeah. overnight. Okay, yeah, that's great. So you're like six, five, yeah, six percent. Yeah, and it was interest yeah. only. What do I care? That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, credit unions are a great deal, right? Like if you're doing a lot of business and you you create that relationship with them, they're easy. They're they're super easy to deal with too. Yeah, credit unions. My experience has been they're a little bit more uh, flexible. Like yeah. they're they're less rigid to the rules. Their their regulation is different. They're yes. not regulated by uh, FISRA that or Fisco, formerly Fisco uh, yeah. in Ontario. I, I believe they're regulated differently, but uh, yeah. you know, don't quote me on that. Um, so it sounds like you've kind of had, well, you've got a, a depth of understanding here that didn't come overnight. No. <laughs> when did you buy your, your first property? Uh, I bought my first property, geez, 16 years ago, I think. 16 years ago? Yeah. So that puts us back into like 2004, 2003? I guess. It was right around there, 2002, 2003. I don't really remember. Okay. And I bought like three in quick, um, quick order. I bought two duplexes in Newmarket and I bought a, a, a property in the junction in Toronto. Oh, okay. And uh, what's now, now turning, but at that time that was a bold move. Oh, well, I mean, like we, I mean, we knew it was a rougher area, but I went like one night I couldn't sleep or whatever. So I took the dog for a walk at like 4 a.m. And there was like, hookers at the end of the street and not not the good looking ones <laughs> no i was like i don't understand like you're wearing track pants <laughs> and you're uh, yeah. soliciting me i'm like okay i'm gonna walk away now <laughs> like uh, that's the uh, the discounted neighborhood i guess yeah or not anymore i mean no, i know it's obviously anymore. uh it's funny how they've turned those areas into hipster you know it's just you know rough became kind of cool same thing's happening in hamilton too oh definitely yeah like, like that ottawa and uh, main street building i bought i mean yeah like Ottawa it's, Street's cool now. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Caro restaurant, right? Everybody go to the Caro restaurant. They're my tenants. So. Oh, okay. I'm going to I'm gonna look that up. C-A-R-O. C-A-R-O. Okay, Caro restaurant. Um, so you were, you were about, well, 2003-ish uh, to start. And over that time, approximately what, what range are you in, in in terms of doors across your portfolio? 170-ish. About 170 now? Uh, and I'm, over time, you've sold a few, like the I've small stuff. I've sold a few. I sold, yeah, that building I bought, the 18 unit I sold to my partners because they, okay. they annoyed me. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've bought and sold a bunch of 12, eight, eight unit properties, um, just some yeah. small stuff, a lot of three, four unit properties. Okay. And they were all, was it like a kind of a game of chess trying to build the portfolio bigger, pick, pick something that's going to be a better long-term solution for you? Uh, some were, yes. Yeah. Some were just because, you know, the the... the like I sold the 18 unit was because the partners basically annoyed me. Okay. So I was just like, this is not worth it. Where are your partners coming from on these deals? Uh, where did they used to come from or where do they come from now? Ah, tell me all. You know what? It's all it, Literally, they're all from networking. So I've met them outside of um, things. So on the 18 unit, a lot of them came from Rain. Okay. Uh, so real estate investment network. I still got a couple of guys from there that I, I still enjoy working with. So um, then they want to be passive. They don't want to be active, right? right. It's it's the, the problem when they want to be active investors yet they don't have the time or, or not the time. The guys who don't have the time are typically easy to work with too. But the guys who want to be active investors and they're there all the time. And I'm like, well, do it yourself. Like I can help you just go ahead and do it yourself. You don't need to be invested with me, right? Right. Because then they're just... Yeah, they're constantly at it. So anybody who does want to work with joint ventures, like I'm just saying, like you don't. The, the, my two rules are: I won't work with anybody who wants to be an active investor. Okay. And number two is, um, I don't work with anybody who's giving me like their last of their money. Oh, okay. So if it's if this is a significant portion of their portfolio, I don't want to work with them. In because that turns them into an active investor. Right, right. I was just about to say there, there's uh, there's that panic and fear that will rear its ugly head when the things that they don't understand come up. Right, if they're yeah. on their last dollar, it just it'll just make your life hell. Well, that's it. It's not worth it. It's yeah, not worth absolutely. It at the end of the day, so might make that mistake once or twice, and then you realize, nope, not doing that again. That's right. Yeah, I uh, I can definitely relate. Like again, like just like working on the contracting side, having you know done some consulting on builds and stuff, like the more somebody 
you know, it's just a piece of their portfolio. They're an investor about it and, and they just don't have the time. And they're like, I want you to do this. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm more content for 100%, sure. hundred percent. It's just way easier, right? It's a way better relationship. Yeah. So you were doing your networking, uh, the real estate investment network rain. I've actually never been a member or two of their events, but I know we've got tons of new ones that are kind of like taking over now yeah, is like, rain still the thing or you're, you're hitting up some other stuff. Well, I don't go to anything anymore, really. No, no. you just got so much residual. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, I'd rather just spend my nights doing something different, right? Like right. I don't, I, I don't feel from an educational perspective, I'm going to get much out of it anymore. Yeah. And then, and then it becomes a networking thing. Yeah. And you know what? I, I, I have a group of uh, people that I, you network with, I already. network with already. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I honestly, I think it's, if you're a new investor, you want to get into it, it's the best place to go, whether yep. it's rain, so reads gain. Uh, I think you have your meetup too. Yeah. Um, you know, like there's tons of places you can go and not spend very much money. I mean, my, uh, if you're in the Durham region, my buddy Quinton yeah, runs, good guy. Uh, runs a great one out there. They got a yeah. couple hundred members, you know, so like these are great places to go. It's just a matter of, you know, now I have to look at the, t it's time for me, right? Mm -hmm. So what am I going to spend my time at that's going to give me value? Absolutely. Right? So is it is going to this event now going to add value to my life? Yeah. And it's like, well, I'm not a, I'm not a really a real estate agent anymore. I don't really sell real estate. You have a team, right? I, I, I kind of have a team. I got one guy who works for me, with me who I okay. give my, I refer to, and he's a real estate investor himself. He's a good agent. So okay. it's good. Brandon uh, Diamond. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, that works great for me. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. And yet, you know, I don't, um, yeah, I don't really feel the need to have to go out there and hustle. Well, you're not at that point anymore too, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the beautiful thing about this show is I've got people at all stages and you're sort of at that mature stage where you've already hustled, you did that part. And now you're at the point where you know you, you know what you know, you don't really need to do, you know, you have your core group of people that you probably talk to and, and they put you push each other and, mm -hmm. and that's how you grow. Um, that's the part that I'm still really building. I don't so much like to go to the networking events for the teaching and lessons and stuff. Like I can get new concepts from podcasts yeah. um, and I feel the same. Like when I go and that's the, way, the reason I started my network, uh, like the meetup was I just wanted networking and I wanted yeah. people who are, are, are players in the industry to just come have a beer and talk. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I totally get where you're, you're saying what you're saying there, because there are still those that just want to go and they sit and want to sit through the education. Yeah. Well, I mean, for instance, I was at a real estate um, technology conference in Las Vegas over the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, there I mean, some of the insights were great, like Google and Facebook were there talking and how what's coming up. And I mean, some of it's a little scary, eh? what they're doing with search and the artificial intelligence and all that type of stuff. Oh, yeah. Like some of it's like, holy, like this is like Terminator shit. Like, am, I, am I the only one sitting here worried about this? Like Elon Musk is worried about it. <laughs> well, yeah. And he's a pretty smart guy. So, yeah, he's, he's the first to say that people are way too aggressive with the AI stuff. Oh, yeah. So, you know, like I'm sitting there listening, so like I'm there and I'm learning new stuff, which is great. Yet at the end of the day, it was the networking. Yeah. Right. Like that's really why I went. Like some of my close friends that I don't get to see very often. So yeah. let's meet up there. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's really cool. And, you know, I, this podcast is a great way for me to network. I get to, uh, you know, sit down with, with people who, you know, might be hard to get an hour of their time otherwise. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, it's great for that. Um, do you mind walking me through a recent deal? Like what's, what's a recent one that's kind of interesting? Well, they're kind of boring. They're apartment buildings. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like I, well, <laughs> I, I'm thinking more right. of a burr, yeah. like what was okay. something that so, you needed well, to transition? All, 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 all my buyers are burrs, by the way. Okay. So they are burrs. So let, let's, I'll walk you through the, my main strategy behind okay, them. Okay. Start and then, with the strategy. Then we'll do the example. Then we'll do Perfect. The yeah. All right. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just doing a long-term burr. So I can't go in and get a property vacant anymore. And I don't really want to, um, you know, I'm kind of a live and let live. You want to move great. I'll renovate your unit mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll raise the rent to market. And yet if you don't want to move, Hey, great. Don't worry about it. We'll continue in our landlord tenant relationship because okay. you get a big enough portfolio and people just naturally leave, right? People, jobs change, life situations change. So there's always people moving. Um, so I don't really worry about it. And, and like, I, I figure I'm going to get about 25 to 50% turnover in two years. Over in one building. In one yeah. building. So I need 25% to be able to refinance that to basically pull out 75 to 110% of my money. 
So if 20 to 50, 25 to 50 percent turnover, you'll be able to do what you just said and pull out most of your money. Most, most, if not all or more of, of my money. That's interesting because I'll tell you that my biggest hesitation and why I haven't got in, like I've got duplexes, but why I haven't done multifamily to the large scale is I'm a, I'm a speed renovator, like speed turnover kind of guy. And the thought that I'd be at the mercy of tenants has stopped me. Yeah, it really has. And to be honest with you, it's a patience game. And yeah, but I, patience I, with private money, you know, if I'm wow, into that, yeah, I, you don't need private money, right? Because you're buying an asset that has like you're buying an asset that has tenants. Absolutely. So there right? is. But, so you can sit there and wait, and they'll leave. I mean, we pay some of them to leave too. Yeah, a little little cash for keys. So in that number, there's there's a little bit of money here and there to pay yeah, people but I mean, to go. Yeah. Like we'll go max three grand, right? We're not. Okay. We're not the guys out there offering people twenty five grand to leave. We just don't. That happens. Oh, 100 percent. And the people they're offering it to don't take it. They never take it. They they just they're like, wow, they're offering me that much. They must re you know this must be really worth something. Yeah. So when I say three grand, they're like, oh, give me this, and, and we just walk away. They're like, oh. They really don't care because they don't. They want to yeah, stay. Yeah, they just stay. don't want to leave. Yeah, like I'm, I'm okay with that. You don't want to. You don't want to leave. I get it. You know, you had a good deal. Fine. Yeah. Happy, happy you're here. Pay your pay your rent on time. Yeah. You do your thing. I'll do my thing as a landlord. Yeah, I like that approach. Right, and and that's why, like, I don't really have stress around it. Like at the end of the day, I have you know two units vacant right now that we're renovating, and it's like fine, and. So it doesn't affect my cash flow negatively. I don't have to carry a losing yeah. asset. And over time, it's just, it'll do its thing. Fair enough. I guess my challenge with it is, and and I've, I've toyed with the idea of a joint venture for one of these, and I just wasn't sure how long it would take. And there are no guarantees, right? So I tell my joint venture partners that my goal, my like, I don't, no guarantees in life, but my Long-term goal would be to have them have all their money back within four years. Okay. And then we still own an asset that outperforms. Yes. And I tell them my aggressive goal is for you to have all your money back within two. Okay. So out of the last six properties I've bought, um, so two are really new, but the other four, we've uh, three out of the four, we got all our money back within two years. The, the last one was nobody ever left. Just no one wanted to leave? No one wanted to leave. It's in a good area of town. The rents aren't even, like, they're bad compared to market. Yeah. But compared to the rest of the portfolio, how we bought, like, they're paying about $1,000. Yeah. Whereas market's probably, like, thirteen, fourteen. Okay. But it's not terrible. It's not terrible. But I buy stuff that's in the 700s where market rents are fourteen, fifteen hundred, right? So I'm like, even though the rents aren't that bad, it's just a continuing thing. We could have refinanced it and took a little bit of money out. But we just said, I oh, would we'll just hold that one and figure that one out later because it was only a little one anyways. Well, so. and if you have a, a greater portfolio that can absorb a cash negative, if it is, um, mm. then you don't worry about it. Yeah. Well, it's not cash negative, right? It's still, oh, cash it's still, it's still cash positive. Okay. So you're not, you're not at that stage. Um, I guess. Okay. So I want to dig into this a, a little bit more as far as the, the approach goes. So, so I, I'm, I'll tell you the going. story first. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. And then you, and we'll no, go ahead. so, this is a small one that we did. So we bought it. Uh, we bought a nine unit on the mountain last December, closed in January, uh, this time last year. And I probably overpaid for it because no offense, plus we're all overpaying for things. Um, and yeah, I bought it in January. I paid one, three, five or something for a nine unit. My buddies who are realtors in the multi space called me and told me I was nuts. So yeah, thanks. Okay. Whatever. So we bought it, there was three vacant units out of nine. So we bought it cash and we're like, okay, we're just gonna put financing on it later. We'll renovate these units, we'll get them rented and then we'll put financing on it. So cash, private, whatever you wanna do, right? Um, so, and then in that time while we were renovating, two more people left. Okay. So we got five. So we renovated five units in there. And so by April we had re renovated and released five units and the bank gave us a value of like 1.9 million on it okay and they gave us 75 percent of that 70 so, or 75 75 percent okay so new value these are the questions i was gonna ask you so yeah. that's that's great you just that's what i figured you cut right to the chase so so the 75 percent I, I take it you've listened to to at least one episode of uh, of this podcast before <laughs> 
No. No? No. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you called out the meetup and then you, you knew how I, how well, I approached it. I saw your it. meetup on there and then um, I was talking to George um, El Masri, who does Well Off. Yeah. And I, I asked him if he knew, like literally just before I'm like, hey, what do you know about Andrew Hines? Oh, he has a good podcast, blah, blah, blah. He does this, this. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, is it, uh, is it filmed? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, go, go, go put something in my hair. <laughs> Fix my hair. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, so the way those numbers work out, if you bought for one, three, three, five, your new mortgage is around one, four point two five, sorry, one, four, two, five. Yeah. Uh, so you would have had rental costs. Yeah, we were about 50 grand. Only? Yeah. Oh, so you basically pulled all your money out. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. So within four months. In four months. Yeah. From closing to. So that's a slam dunk. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're, you know, if we were to track your progress on a, on a graph, I'm pretty sure we'd see some exponential growth in the, the recent years in terms of numbers of doors you're adding. Um, I mean, I'm pretty steady. Like it's, um, what, last year? Last year was slow, actually. I think we only bought a 20 unit. The last, sorry, 20, 2019, we bought 80. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, there you go. That's a good year. Um, the year before that, we were only 20. The year before that, we were 40. It's just when the deals come up, right? It's we're pretty patient, you know. We don't need to go buy more yet. If a deal comes along that looks good, we'll buy it. Okay, so you're patient. You're able to take your approach. Let me give you a scenario because I, I mean, for me, this is kind of where I see things. I had I had an opportunity to buy a building, eight plex. It would have been um, it had sinking floors on both sides, so there's a problem with uh, other roof water or drain water rotting studs in the entire three stories. It could be oh it's sunk. It's, it's sunk all the way from the top down, four stories, sorry, and all the way down and it compounded somehow. The top you know, every single unit had a similar sinking on the same wall. So you felt like you're walking downhill into it. It wasn't the foundation? Not the foundation, no. It was in the inside wall. Oh. Yeah, so and it was on opposite sides of the building. So both right where the roof drain was. So I think there was there was some sort of leaking happening yeah. and it caused a major problem. Well, anyways, the owner wanted, you know, like one point six million for these eight units. And I'm like, whoa, okay, no. Yeah. Um was it downtown know, Toronto? No, maybe that would be a good deal, but no, no, Hamilton, Ottawa area, Ottawa Street area. Um anyway, so I kind of put in a couple offers at a million bucks. And I knew I, I kind of felt like I was overpaying, which you just said it's kind of a standard thing. Looking at that deal, I just had some serious hesitation in that I would have, you know, if I didn't JV it, I would have been cash negative. I could have bought it, got a bank mortgage, JV partner comes in with the money to reno and, and down payment, which keeps me cash positive as we go through. And then we go back after the course of, you know, maybe a year or two if we can get that turnover. But the, my challenge with that one was I would need to get all four units vacant to fix the problem. So you'd literally, I, you'd have to do a reno eviction. Reno eviction. Yeah. And you could do that, right? You can, yeah. you can say, hey, you've got to go. We've yeah. got to fix well, this. I mean, then they have the opportunity to come back. So I've never done the reno eviction. It's funny, though. I was talking to somebody yeah. last Friday. Uh, I don't know if you know Andrew Trebetta. He's a no. paralegal in Hamilton. He's saying that he's done it a couple times and nobody's ever come back. Yeah, I'd like to meet him. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can introduce you to him. He's yeah. a great, great dude. But um, yeah, I'm like, well, you know what? I, at some point, I don't want to take that risk. Mm-hmm. Um, it just depends on the opportunity. If the opportunity was big enough, then it's fine, right? Yeah. Like if you, if you could do it and half the people come back and you still make your money. Yeah, because I can do an increase as well. Yeah, you it's can get not going to be above guideline increase. It's still not going to be enough. Yeah. Well, it depends on what the rents are, but typically it's not enough. Um, but yeah, I mean it's something like that you do need to just get them vacant because no offense like that could be condemned exactly right and there were so many things in it like i'm i'm not scared off by structural problems in buildings like i've, I've seen it all um i i saw it i even brought one of my key contractors through the guys that, that works for me a lot and they're like yeah we can fix this we know we're gonna jack it up like yeah. we, we would we would made a plan we would jack it back up but yeah 100 percent. you jack it post it in the basement you yeah. do all that stuff new footing new yeah, if you need to, you put a yeah. footing. Like, I think that's the thing. Like, a, a rookie real estate investor, you know, they would go in and be like, oh, no, we can't do that. But there's a solution to every problem. Yeah. Well, it's time, it's time and money, right? Yeah. If you got enough time and enough money, nothing yeah. matters. Okay. So, so that scenario in my head, if I could have got the one side vacant, made a lot more sense because I would have basically just made him an offer for less the cost I thought it would take to fix. Yeah. 
and I go in and I wanted to make it into something stellar because I know that area is, oh, you know, beautiful. Ottawa Cannon area yeah. is it's on its way up and, yep. and, and only getting better and better. Um, ultimately, I passed because I just didn't feel confident in my first multi deal like that, ha um, having four tenants that I really needed to get out all at yeah. once. I mean, my first one was 18 units vacant and we had a foundation problem. Vacant then. though is amazing. Vacant is amazing. Is it full? So it was a fully vacant building? Fully vacant See, building. See, like, give me that all day long. I will yeah. take that all day long. I know it, it'll burn cash but we we'll just fly through one unit at a time and just rent them out, rent them out. Well, no, we had to get occupancy, right? Oh, you had to get occupancy on the so, whole thing. And it's, no, well, we got occupancy on, at six at a time because there's three basically three basic wings. Oh, okay. So the city allowed us to finish one, go to the next one, go to the oh, next okay. one, right? So. so there was quite the burn on that one. Did you come in cash on that one? Uh, we were, that was the credit union. Okay, so the credit union, even though there was no tenants, they, they gave they, you a mortgage. Oh, yeah. Wow, well, okay. Because they see the plan, right? So they know your plan. So so in other words... They're, they're partnering with you, basically. Worth sitting down with a credit union if, if you got a plan for well, that. Well, like literally, your eight unit, that's, I would have taken that to a credit union mm -hmm. and you could have gotten yeah, the first financing and you could have got all your construction costs covered. So I just say, hey, this is what it's going to cost. Show them a couple of quotes. Well, so what I would tell you is you would increase your quotes because yeah. we actually gave our actual quotes to them and they're like, this is too low. Oh, so just increase them. And, and, and they're, I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, if we had to go, like if you defaulted and we had to go get this work done, we could never get it done at that price. Oh, okay. And I said, okay, so you want me to increase it? And they're like, you probably should. <laughs> so then, therefore, like it's like, fine. So they basically paid 100% of our construction costs while loaning us 80% of the value of the loan, of the things, right? So. So walk me through that process. As you do the work, do you submit like a request for, for a refund? Request for funds. They, yeah. they bring their appraiser out, says, okay. yeah, there's been a significant amount of work. You give them the, the invoices and that type of thing. And then they'll... Do they only pay you based on what you've paid and what you can show them invoices for? Yes, what you can show them invoices for. Okay, so you only get that. So you say they're covering 100%, but technically... It's what you can show invoices. 100% of what you can show invoices for, which might be 100% of all your costs. Yeah. Okay. 80% of what you show invoices for, which is 80% of your cost. That's a better way of saying it. Yeah, but so you, you legitimately were in a situation where they did end up funding uh, 100% uh, of the cost. Nine, probably 90%. 90? Okay. Well, no, well, like the, the construction guy was my partner, so we GC'd the whole thing. So yeah. if we had to put a general contractor yeah. fee on there, like we would have... Paid a lot more. We would have paid a lot more, and that would have yeah. been the difference, right? So. Mm -hmm. I've always general contracted my own stuff, which yeah. is a pain in the butt. Well, and that's why they Save. came back to us and yeah. said... Like we can't do it because we have to hire a general, right? Yeah. So I mean, you got to add 20, 25 percent to it, and that's that difference, right? And I would say that's on the low end. I would say so too. Yeah. Like there are some that say they only charge, you know, ten percent or you know, fifteen, which fantastic if you can find them. They're usually very specialized. Well, so I have a guy, and I do that with. Yet I'm special to him because I've given him a lot of business. And mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you gotta you gotta hang on to those relationships. Yeah. Well, and it's it's funny though because he gets so so busy, and it's like. I mean, I can't, I don't use him on my apartment buildings anymore, right? Because he's too busy. I have one guy who does that. Yet mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an investor in, a, in another restaurant and we have him doing it because it's too big for my one guy and he has a crew, so. Okay. So stepping, uh, stepping into the acquisition of these buildings mm -hmm. and finding one that works, like what do you look for to know a building will work? Because will work? you said you do overpay sometimes. I overpay. I mean, last buildings we bought, we bought it at a 3.25 cap rate. Okay, so in, and sometimes that's deceiving too, well, right? I mean, the market rents are 100% below market, right? Like So with full occupancy, it was at a 3.25 cap? Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's like that's like stress and anxiety when I, when I see that. Why? Uh, Who cares? Well, I suppose who cares as long as your partners are on board for the ride. Like, yeah, I mean, you yeah. just got to say it's longer term, right? You're not yeah. going pitching six months. Yeah, we're, we're doing something because we know it creates long term wealth. You don't have the time, but I, you know, I'll do this. I'll head it up and we'll make sure it works kind of thing. Yeah. And it's, you know, and as a portfolio grows, it's just consistent. You know, we're getting, hey, we have, we've done this many units in this building, this many units in this yeah. building. This one's been a little slower, but, you know, these other ones will cover off that one if we if we need it right so yeah okay no absolutely right as long as you've got some you know some units that are generating or you've got a couple of buildings that'll fund your other one and it's in your greater portfolio do you have um like the same investors across several buildings yes 
so you, you you keep it friendly and and that way you can slide money across between them as well right? yeah so the majority of my portfolio is with one investor and then i got a couple other investors in a couple other buildings just on the side that mm -hmm. i've had for a long time uh and all the new stuff is basically with one or two different investors okay and you are full-time like you would you describe your full-time income as just being from your properties no 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 i mean i I still make money, I guess, in as a real estate agent. Okay, so through your through your team yeah, and, and the team. activities and referrals that you're doing, so you're still yeah, getting that. I still get that. Um, I actually manage a real estate office now too because I got bored, so okay. I went back and got actually a job, so I'm salaried just, job. Just with uh, Keller Williams. With Keller Williams in Oakville, yeah, Signature. Okay. So uh, my job is basically mentoring and training agents, which awesome is basically what I like to do, anyways. So. Okay. I basically go hang out at the office and talk to people. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I, like if I needed to, I probably could, but I mean, we, do, we don't take a draw from the, the properties or anything like that. We just let it all sit there and pile up and go buy more stuff and just accumulate. At some point, it just becomes a game, right? So Yeah. And I'm, I'm like that with my properties. I don't want to touch the money that they make. Yeah. I just want to let them build and build and build because that's like investment well, money. For me, real estate yeah. is a net worth, is, is, is for yeah. net worth, right? Um, for cash flow, I, I kind of do the other things. So I don't know, you know, Irwin, right? See yeah, that? Irwin, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he like, so he's promoting this options trading thing now. Yeah. So I've been doing options trading for five years. Really? Yeah. So did you know some of the guys that he knew, like the Omega trading guys? Omar. Or? Omar. It, Omar I met at Rain five years ago. It's not Omega, is it? It's, 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 it's Theta. Theta. <laughs> theta, yeah, yeah. So close. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, whatever. They, they're all Greek. Yeah, they're all Greek. <laughs> um, so I've known him for five years. He got me into it, yeah. right? So, and... Yeah, so so you... Okay, so this is interesting, and I'll just... Because, you know, when Erwin mentioned it, it was way out of left field for me, and I had no idea um, what he was getting at. And then I went to his event, and, and I heard Omar talk about it. And... Um, don't you need a pretty huge bankroll for that to uh, to generate significant? So, to significant? What's significant? Well, okay. <laughs> so, say you wanted to generate a hundred grand a year profit. Okay. Options trading. Would you or would you not need about four hundred thousand dollars liquid to do that? No. No. What do you think you need? Oh, correction. What What have uh, you uh, seen uh, as a need? Two to three hundred. Two to three hundred can do that. You like it's funny. I mean, I'm probably up fifty five percent so far year to date. Just this year, okay. Just this year. Uh, last year, like last year, I actually dipped at the end, so I ended up like thirty something. But you like compare that to the market, it's really mm -hmm. good. Um, I mean, I got my buddy in the states. I was just hanging out with who I introduced this to in February, and in March is when he started doing this, and like he's up like almost seventy percent. Yeah. Right, and it's just like. It, you talked to me about significant income from it, hundred thousand dollars, and it's like it's very easily done. And I tell you though, you wouldn't start with three hundred thousand in your account. No, right? This is a learned skill you build that you build. So like, start with ten, fifteen grand in there. Something that if you lose twenty percent of it, you don't. It's like okay, well, I lost twenty percent. I lost two grand. I've spent more at you know Starbucks over the year or whatever. Right. Right. Yet it's it's learning that skill. That's then, because that's what I did. And then when I, I learned the skill, now every time I, I refinance a property, it goes into that account. Gotcha. Okay, right? so you're just building it up. So I build it up over time, and now it provides a significant portion of my income. So that's a significant portion of your income now, okay. And then I own probably like seven other businesses too that, just to, just to diversify. Um, so I own uh, parts of, well, one restaurant and then uh, we're building another restaurant actually in Omar's building. Okay. It's going to be Victoria's Steakhouse in Hamilton. Okay. Uh, that's opening in January. And then I own part of that Caro restaurant that's in my oh, building. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, basically, I met, this is one of my first investments. I met the guy. He's like, a, a, seemed like a good restaurant. Like he was a general manager at Canoe. He opened a couple other restaurants for other people in Hamilton. He said, I want to open my own, but I have no funds. I said, well, I need a good tenant. Yeah. And I got money that I can put in. So, so, and we basically it was construction costs that we put in anyways, right? Yeah. Um, so, and then he's a good operator. So he came to me and said, like, I want to open another one. I'm like, definitely, I'll be your partner on it, right? And then I own a couple of uh, Keller Williams franchises, minority owner. I own a part of a mortgage broker franchise thing. I own, uh, have you ever heard of True Local? No. TrueLocal.ca, their online meat delivery. 
Okay. So like organic, grass-fed, um, naturally non-horm- no hormones, okay. like meat type thing, and delivered right to your door. Interesting. So, yeah. And then uh, just a couple other like little things over time, you know, gold mines, that type of stuff, like that so, people like p- private uh, placement stuff. So you've taken that whole uh, seven streams of income thing to heart and, and gone even beyond that, I'm guessing. Well, I mean, I, I had a realization probably four years ago or something that 99.9% of my money, all my income came from real estate, either being a real estate agent, private mortgages, owning real estate, mm-hmm. um, coaching real estate agents. Right. And it's like, wow, yeah, I really need to diversify away from this. And, you know, again, I don't need my own money to invest in real estate. So why would I invest my own money? I'd rather take that and, and share it with somebody, even as 50 50. I mean, they're taking risk by investing and I'm taking the risk by, you know, I, I don't make any money until they get all their money back. Oh, OK. Right. So I'm 50 percent of the profits. So, yeah, so you're invested in in with your work and your knowledge and everything yeah. in that sense. And then I can take the money and put it into this other trading. Yeah. And and earn actual good income. Yeah, I guess uh, like I absolutely believe in diversification. I mean, I just when I came to the realization of real estate, it was like that one thing that I, I felt like could always bank on and that people will always need a place to live. Uh, and I agree. Locationally, definitely I want to diversify. So I had everything in London still do. And, you know, it made me want to start looking up here just to diversify. You know, what if the economy in London changes? You know, yeah. would like to like to have some stuff around here that it wouldn't feel the burn the same way, right? Because when everything went down in the Golden Horseshoe, like when Oakville and Burlington went down, London didn't. Yeah. Kept going. You know, that was a great year. So, um, you know, it's, it's obviously great to diversify. So, Mark, you mentioned you love coaching. Coach me now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're you're the the multi uh, the multi residential whiz. I'm looking at another deal, and I see. I'm trying not to just go where there's cash flow. I want local. I I, I want these markets like Burlington Hamilton because I live here. Yeah, and it, to me, I I don't feel like I should have to travel for good real estate. Uh, so I'm looking at one. It is in Chatham. Got kind of put on my desk. It's a downtown, beautifully renovated building. Uh, six units res, two units commercial. Both commercial ones are rented mid lease, at least five years, at least four years left on each one. Um, some renovations to do in the res, but it's a 6.7 cap currently with one unit half renovated, no rent coming in. The, when you hear numbers like that, does it sound like it's a good deal or does it sound like it's a headache? Well, you lost me at Chatham. Yeah, no, I kind of lost me at Chatham. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I have friends who do very well in Chatham and yeah. Windsor and other places. I mean, Windsor's freaking going nuts right now yeah i know um i still it's like is it people just going there because it's cheap and it's cash flow but i went to cornwall for that too yeah exactly. and i made great cash flow in cornwall and i just waited and again like i didn't we didn't hardly any work out there and like two years later five years later you're able to refinance for whatever amount more right so if it's just patient money then sure, right? I don't know how much of an upside you can get in that. Like, I think there's an instant lift just by just by uh, finishing the the unit. Yeah, instantly push push the value up. I figured I could probably get that value uh, if if the cap rate could be preserved over the next couple of years. Get that value up to one point five, one point six, and right now it's listed for for nine fifty. So well, is, not listed. Is this an and or scenario? Like, if you did that, you can't do something else. See, that's, so you're trying that's where to... I'm kind of yeah. That's kind of where where I'm sitting. So if I if I did a true JV on it. Um, then I would be able to do other things. But if I wanted to leverage private money, you know, against my real estate to do it, then it would probably stop me from doing other things. And that's where I'm really like, say, hitting the brakes and yeah. saying, you know what, that doesn't feel like something I want to do. Right. Uh, I, I mean, and that's, so you got to look at your portfolio and what your joint ventures or what your, like how you're going to finance it. And if it's going to limit you from doing something else you want, then obviously yeah. the answer is, is there, it, does that provide me with a better return? No, yes or no. Yeah. Right. So if you bought like an eight unit in Hamilton and even if you paid a million, million two for it, yet you could go ahead and increase the rents 40 to 80%. Over the course of a couple of years. Over the course of years. Yeah. Could you refinance that and get a heck of a lot more money out? See that, I feel like I, I, I in fact could. Yeah. The challenge has been finding the deals, but you're obviously not necessarily having the challenge. I mean, it's look, I mean, the deals are out there. Mm-hmm. Listed or un- unlisted? Unlisted. Okay. Unlisted. You just got to know who to talk to. So, <laughs> well, Mark, you can't say that and not say more. <laughs> well, you got to talk to guys like me who are connected. Yeah. Okay. You can't be afraid to use an agent. 
Oh no, not at all. Not at all. Like I'm so that that one that was just brought to me is not listed. Yeah. But it just, you know, it wasn't where I was looking and I I really try very very uh, specifically not to have shiny object syndrome. I don't, you know, that's why the stock thing to me is like, I'm focused on real estate right now. Yeah. Uh, it's not that I don't think it's fantastic. It's just like my head's in real estate right now. You should put 10 grand into it. And yeah. It oh yeah. How much of my time are we talking here? It, you know, it's addictive. Um, yeah. Like even then, like 15, 20 minutes a day. Like I haven't done anything t- yet. Oh no, that's a lie. I bought back Tesla puts today and okay. took $3,000 profit off the table and, Okay. Oh, ones that you had. And, and literally yeah. that took me 30 seconds. I looked and I was like, oh, it's, um, I've got 81% of my value and it's January 17th. I'll just buy that back right now. Okay. So now you don't have to have any exposure on, on that stock. Yeah. Not that you'd mind owning Tesla. If at you, if 285? You had no, I'd love to own a 285. I mean, four or five months ago, you wouldn't say that, but I was, anyways, I was yeah. too heavy in Tesla then. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. But I, I would say, honestly, it's, a, that's, if I had to go back and do it all over again, yeah, I would do the combo for sure and learn that skill. So do do both, you're saying? Yeah. Because it's a skill that once you cash out of something mm-hmm. and throw it into this, at least then you're providing yourself with a 30, 40% return minimum. Yeah. And then once you, if you find a good piece of real estate that you can take a hundred, like grow 100% of your, your net worth in a, in a, or 100% of the money in a year, yeah. take it out of there, put it there, it can always come back to the options right i think the key is there is timing right if it, if it truly can be whittled down to something that only takes you know 20 minutes a day oh, yeah. then there's there's no problem there like i've seen lift in real estate like real estate i put nothing into go back and immediately have like 200 grand in equity the next year and did nothing yeah and i'm like well that's pretty hard to argue with well that's right yeah. right and so that's why i think it's a combination of both though yeah while you're sitting on cash waiting for that next opportunity what are yeah. you making on it nothing nothing <laughs> So well, even even if you went and bought a stock and just started writing covered calls on it, yeah. you'd be making twelve to fifteen percent a year. Yeah, even on like TD okay. or Enbridge. So yeah, for those who are not following this discussion, go back to episode thirty. I believe it's seven with Irwin Zito. It might have been thirty nine. It's one of those numbers. Irwin's episode. He talks about it there and kind of explains the concept. Yeah, you're um, basically insuring. Yeah, stocks. You're basically becoming an insurer. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, selling an insurance policy. If this if this stock goes down, I'll buy it at this price. That's correct. And you sell that for a fee. So you take the fee, and if it never does go down, then that fee is your money. That's and, correct. Uh, it's probably the uh, the easiest way of explaining it. I think so. So okay. So going back to real estate because yeah. uh, uh, this is that a real is, estate podcast. This is a real estate podcast. <laughs> Not that I, I truly do believe in the whole you know seven streams of income, and I, I don't believe that uh, many multi multi millionaires have only one stream. I believe that there usually is a, a, a diversity there. So that's great. Um, so looking at some Maltese, uh, specifically in Hamilton, it's a great, great market, growth market, I think. Um, and, you know, the surrounding Golden Horseshoe, too. Um, finding deals. So obviously knowing the right guys, networking with with people like like you, Mark. And now you know that I'm uh, I'm looking. All right. <laughs> so but uh, there's also the challenge there. But you're looking too, right. Yeah, but you're not going to buy what I'm going to buy. What are you going to buy? 20, 30, 50, 100? Sure. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not buying an eight unit building. You're not buying eight anymore. I mean, I bought that nine unit. Literally, I bought that nine unit because we hadn't bought anything for a year. Yeah, we hadn't bought it, and I was like, oh, I just got to buy something. Yeah, and I'm like, it came up to my on my plate, and nobody else that I knew was looking at the time, so I went ahead and did the deal. Yeah, um, and every I actually showed it to a couple people, and they said it was too much. I said, fine, no problem. If you don't buy it, I'll buy it. Right. Um, yeah, and it's funny. I'm doing a deal for a guy right now. It's 20 units, and it's you know I can't buy everything. Yeah, well, that's actually how one of my uh, you know that's really how I got started in real estate. So uh, student rentals were my game, and still are. Um, but one a good friend of mine was just crushing it in that game, mm-hmm. and he would take the very like best deals, like the ones that didn't need an addition built. Yeah. And then anything that needed an addition because he didn't want to get bothered with construction, he'd say, "Hey, Heinz, come look at this one." And uh, he was very honest about it. He's like, yeah, well, of course I'm going to take my pick because I can't do everything. Yeah. But the best ones, he would always find a way to do them. But you know what? It was okay with me. And I'm not saying that's what would happen with you because you're just, you're in a bigger playing field now, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, but that, that, I mean, I was able to create like over a million dollars in net worth by riding his coattails uh, yeah. for at least a good chunk of that was, was, you know, taking the deals that he didn't want. Well, I mean, too bad I didn't know you two months ago because there was a great deal on Lock Street that never came up. 
private that yeah. uh, it was eight units. Yep. I think it was less than a million bucks yeah. too. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd love to get into something where I could, you know, creep in just under the million mark and, and value add is all, all where I'm at. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of, of the, the structure and joint ventures, I've had some people reach out to me and, you know, I'm kind of mulling that over. I actually don't have any joint ventures in my portfolio right now. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's, but that is it's a way it's to nice grow. It's nice and isn't. That's, you know. Oh, well, the nicety, you know, for long-term ownership is that I don't have anybody to be accountable to other than myself yes. and CRA. Yes. <laughs> They'll come get you. <laughs> Those are the two accountabilities and the bank, I guess. And, too. and the bank, yeah. yeah. Your two partners, CRA and the bank. Yeah, yeah my, my two forever partners there. Yeah. Well, maybe we can pay out the bank one day. Maybe. But Why um, would you? Yeah, you know what? That's that's just it, right? Like I know some people are on their 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 path. I do say this, though, like one property at about five six dollars $600,000 today just bought and held for cash flow will make you a millionaire in 25, 30 years. So I go through that. I run a yeah. basic investing course mm -hmm. at our brokerage and I go through that basically on a $400,000 property. Mm -hmm. Well, even if it doesn't appreciate, even if it doesn't do anything, it'll make you a millionaire. Yeah, just as long as you don't sell it, right? Yeah. <laughs> just don't do anything stupid like sell it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's the- And if you are gonna sell it, just make sure you re reinvest it into something yeah. different or better um because yeah you gotta you, you can't take an asset and then go pay taxes on it and not make a return on it over time right and, well here's the challenge i have in in the states you can you can do a 1031 10, exchange 1031 exchange yeah, and you can't do it in Canada. so if you sell it you're not getting like compounding works for you if you don't sell right you're compounding your value and growing it but you sell it here um you have to pay tax yeah 25 on your capital gains so you're going to pay about 25 percent tax uh so compounding is working against you in that well yeah i mean if you sell an asset that has a hundred thousand dollars you get a hundred realize a hundred thousand dollar gain yeah you're, you're now going back and taking that seventy five thousand yeah. to reinvest so you got to make that hurdle you got to make another th you got to make 33 percent on your money before you even get back to even yes right so something always to consider like I, a lot of it's hard with tax because i look at my portfolio i'm like if you want to get real advanced into the real estate, you know, math, like what's my return on equity, right? Leverage something up at the highest you can possibly get it. And how, how much is the equity that you have in that property generating? Yeah. So I, I'm, our, I'm all an equity guy, ROE. It's all about ROE. ROE. And I think that investors, you know, do a YouTube search, learn about return on equity, because that's kind of where your head needs to be at long term. Maybe that should be one of my uh, first uh, things on uh, YouTube. Yeah, Mark's gonna start a YouTube channel. Not if I beat you to it, but uh. well, you might beat me to it. Like, I, I actually have somebody who is gonna work with me on it now, and she's pushing me more than I push myself yeah. to do stuff like that because she thinks I have a good message and a lot of knowledge and all this. Yeah, crap. you absolutely so, do. Yeah, and I think so. It's just I'm I'm relatively lazy when it comes to doing stuff like this. So, so much work, but if you can just you know sincerely give away content, man, people would people would love it. Yeah, I mean, I do it all the time. I just do it in small groups, right? Well, yeah, so this is a so the hard part, and I, I have it too, is is one you plan because I'm off the cuff. I think you do well off the cuff too. I do well off. The cuff. But uh, with the YouTube videos, for the short and concise, I feel like people really do want bite sized stuff. So yeah. like a ten to fifteen minute video that explains a concept. Yep. And then into the next one, and I think if you can do that with consistency, I've seen some examples of people absolutely well, crushing I mean, it. I, I think you, just from this, you probably watch Graham Stephan. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I hear yeah. what some of your stuff from Graham Stephan, right? It's like, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I watch him too. He's, he's really fantastic. Good. Yeah. So um, I got his YouTube creator thing that I, I- Oh, did you buy it? Okay, yeah, I've, I've considered it. I, I wasn't sure if it would be a, a value, but- I haven't uh, watched all of it yet, so- Yeah, <laughs> does it seem like it's good stuff so far? I think it was 200 bucks US, right? I yeah. bought it on like Cyber Monday or something, and it's it like for 200 bucks, like- yeah. Yeah, so I spent more of that in Vegas the last couple of days. So yeah, well, no, it makes total sense to yeah. just to just give it a crack. I guess I I've kind of had it in my head that I will eventually buy that. It's just I haven't even had the time to to like dig into that. So just yeah. the podcast production and editing and all of that is already a lot. Uh, but for those of you who don't know Graham Stephan, check out his page. So the guy went in three years, built a YouTube page, just posting three times a week videos he liked and uh, ended up turning it into now he makes like two hundred thousand dollars a month between his youtube and his real estate and everything else yeah uh i think i think youtube alone is bringing him like 160 or something yeah i don't know he just posted that like how much i made this week yeah and it's insane like 45 yeah. grand in a week the guy's making and mm -hmm. yeah he's got real estate and, yeah but not a lot not a lot not not like nothing compared to me yeah no no so, but i mean you are probably out of position where you don't really need to do anything so you can kind of just focus on what you want to do yeah right and i think that's where he's at too he doesn't need to do anything well he doesn't need i, I think he still needs youtube 
I don't think he's yeah. in a position that if YouTube stopped tomorrow well that he would stop but he's not going to stop anyway i don't know he's not going to stop like he he can fall back on something else but he can't yeah. just quit and do nothing so grant's point grant's he's younger, message right? well he's young guys yeah, that's a different conversation i mean financial independence i think he has that because he says he lives only off of what his rental properties that, generate that, that is true actually he is yeah. super cheap he's like the among the cheapest yeah. I, I hope one day he agrees to come on my show and uh, we'll, we'll I, talk about how cheap he is uh, listen i'm gonna fly I'll, I'll fly out to los angeles and go to do youtube with him that'd be fun actually yeah yeah he's he seems like a, a real interesting guy but you know just he's actually friends with uh matt mckeever they started their youtube channels at the same time yeah. so matt and uh graham and another guy meet kevin they were all at the oric yeah so i saw didn't he drive around with that guy and look at his property yeah. in london yeah they did uh they okay. did yeah and that was one of uh one of graham's best performing videos was was the one that he uh, he drove around with matt mckeever and saw all his i don't even know who matt mckeever is oh you don't know he's got a uh for for a Canadian real estate uh, YouTube channel, probably the biggest. Okay. Yeah, over fifty thousand subscribers. Yeah, take a look. I mean, he he. Not, not uh, I'm sure he would love to have you on his uh, yeah. his channel. I mean, uh, the Ask Kevin guy it literally just showed up on my YouTube when mm -hmm. he did the review of the um, millennial money thing for Graham oh, Stafford, yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's a uh, yeah there's a lot of uh, great stuff in that that category. I actually love the creative thing. Like to me just being creative coming up with those videos is great the editing part i actually don't mind it's just the time commitment that i that i don't like yeah it, you know because I, I don't like doing things halfway if i do it i'm all in well that's why i haven't started yeah. yet because yeah. it's either i'm going to do it and i'm going to produce to a week yeah or i'm just not going to do it yet yeah because that's the only way you're really going to get momentum yeah without the consistency so now this podcast is once a week for those of you who haven't noticed sunday mornings <laughs> in, in place of church you have this podcast <laughs> that, won't, that won't fly well in uh, texas or alberta <laughs> i'm just joking I, I i remember going i was speaking at, in alberta and um I, I held out my book and this is the bible of rent to own <laughs> and i got like i thought i was going to get death threats or stuff thrown at me yeah. I'm like you just don't say that yeah texas that and uh and uh yeah yeah, that was, that was just tongue in cheek. You know? <laughs> There's room for both. There's room for both. So anyways, yeah, I, I think uh, we had we had some fun at the end of this one. Is there yeah. something that you would want to leave our listeners and viewers with, Mark? What do you mean? Like what? what well, you, you know, key wisdom. You've been in the uh, business. So, you've yeah. been in the business a long time. You've got some knowledge that a lot of people can't relate to. So, so lay it on us. I honestly think the biggest reason for my success and the success I see in others is that I'm not I'm not afraid to take action. Mm hmm. Right. I'm, uh, you know, Omar came to me with that thing and said, Hey, try this. And I was like, okay, five, 10 grand. Sure. I can try that. You know, uh, I get out and go, go to one of these real estate groups, go to a meetup, you know, start watching a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Like not a thing I do is rocket science. Mm -hmm. Like it's super simple stuff. It's just a matter that I've done it so much and I've heard so much of it that it's just become ingrained and it's a second nature to me. Yeah. And it's funny, like I was in Las Vegas and I was having these conversations with the people and they're like, you sure like money. And I'm like, I sure like money for what it can do. Yeah. Like, for instance, like uh, I was staying at a hotel in Vegas and my bag got stolen. Yeah. And I lost my passport and bunch of stuff in the bag and people are freaking out. And I said, don't worry. Like, what do you mean? Well, I'll either get on a plane tonight or I'll grab a hotel and get another plane ride tomorrow and I'll figure this out. Yeah. Like, what about the stuff you lost? I'm like, it's just stuff. Yeah. I'm like, I can get another passport, a couple more suit jackets and more jeans. Like it's, it's no big deal. And money is just at some point becomes a game. Yes. Right. It's just a game of, it's just a game of money. It's like playing Monopoly as a kid. Absolutely. And right? that's where it should be, right? It should be fun. Yeah. I mean, the people, yeah. People who have that connotation that, you know, money is the root of all evil and all that stuff. Well, is air the root of all evil? Because I need that to live just as much as you well, pretty much right. need money, it, like well, and food me, it, and water. It's just a medium of exchange, right? Yeah. I'm just not giving you a cow for a loaf of bread anymore, yeah. right? Or whatever, right? Yeah, so. yeah. So it just, it just makes people more of what they are. So that's why I, I think, you know, going down this road, the people who are listening to this, you're in that, that 1% of people who actually think about real estate investing, who actually understand that their future is in their own hands. Yeah. And yeah. I'd say, and I'd say that a lot of the, even real estate investors I know is, I would just say, learn about money, mm -hmm. learn about like what money is and, and, and the function of it, like how banks work and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's amazing when I talk to people and they don't understand how a bank works and how a bank makes money. Right. Mm -hmm. it's it's interesting 
Absolutely. And the more you learn about that, the stuff, that stuff, then you can go and say, okay, when you're financing, you're like, okay, it's just a little bit deeper understanding. So, okay. So, um, Mark, if people wanted to reach you, where would they go? Um, right now, I guess Instagram. Okay. Uh, live in the dream 40. Live in the dream 40. Yeah. It's cause I retired before I was 40. So. Okay. Awesome. I'll find that, uh, on Instagram. There's no underscores or anything like that. Yeah, It's living and L I V I N underscore the underscore dream underscore 40. Okay. Good thing you clarified that. I think. Okay. I'm going to find that and put it in the show notes. Um, I'll find that, put it in the show notes. And then um, just outside of all this, if you're not doing, I know, I know. So we're filming this in December. This won't go out until the new year, but uh, you're doing some Christmas shopping. What are you doing when you're not focused on real estate and all your different businesses? Uh, golf. Golf. All right. Um, take kids to hockey. Okay. Um, what I, oh, I do Ironmans. I do adventure racing. I do a little bit of that. So I work out a fair bit for that. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, I was going to say, if you want to open up a uh, plant-based restaurant in Burlington, it could really use another one. So maybe offset the steak restaurant that you got. I don't know. I sure do love my steak. <laughs> Balance is key. Um, I, I eat uh, plant-based on the side of my meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard that one before. <laughs> I know. Um, okay. Yeah. I really appreciate this, Mark. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, find me some buildings. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Now that I know. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right, thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching today's episode. Just a friendly reminder to please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you smash the like and subscribe and notification bell. Uh, and also leave a comment. And hey, while you're at it, why not share this episode with somebody you think it could help? It helps this podcast grow and I would really appreciate it. Thanks again. We'll see you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.